we have to get the phenomenon of sexuality in view. Uh, and uh, in, in, in the book, uh, the, the, the section uh, B, being in a sexual situation, uh, runs from 168 to 160. And that, that's the basic, that's the most basic description of the, the core phenomenon or the core experience of sexuality that, that Merle Pondy gives and that we're working with. And I'm going to draw quite a bit on that. In other words, my talking about this chapter is largely going to focus on a couple of paragraphs at the beginning. Um, but you can get a lot out of it. So don't, when you're reading, don't just rip through the chapter and try to get get to the end thinking that the good stuff is back there. Focus on this section first and try to try to get what he's saying here, because then I think uh, if you get this well, then you can you can uh, move into the other stuff pretty effectively. Well, let's say the first sentence of that. He says, uh, pathology reveals a living zone between automatic reflexes and representation in which the sexual possibilities of the patient are elaborated. Um, so he says pathology reveals, well, in the preceding page, he's, he's probably alerted us to the fact, yeah, he's been talking about Schneider again. Uh, Schneider was the, the patient who we talked about before who could grab his nose but couldn't point to it. Um, the guy with the brain injury who's, who's a subject of studying a lot of these things. And Schneider's pathological uh, spatial experience allowed us to understand something about what spatial experience is normally like, like and the same is true with his sexual experience by by um, seeing the problems and the breakdowns that happen in his sexual experience in the, when he has this injury and so on. Uh, we, le we learn something about what sexuality is like in, in, the, in normal life, in everyday life. Um, um, I don't think I'm going to particularly talk about Schneider. Um, it's pretty easy to read. Um, I might come back to it, but I just want. To, but that's what he means when he says pathology reveals. Schneider's case reveals to us that for the normal person, there is a living zone between automatic reflex and representation. So, you know, people. If, if you think, how do people think about sex? Well, you know, they, we we tend to rely on that same kind of mind-body dualism that I was saying we rely on when we were talking about the phantom limb. Um, we we start off thinking about ourselves as detached, self-reflective, self-conscious egos, reflective egos who choose for ourselves and, you know, deploy our action on an already existing objective world. Now, those are the terms in which we normally think about our experience. Um, but what we have been seeing is that, that that kind of experience rests upon a different kind of experience, with, which we studied with the habit body, with lived time, with lived space, and so on, a different kind of experience that, that is the establishing of the world in which that kind of experience is possible. And the terms of that uh, subterranean world, so to speak, that world uh, that falls outside of our reflective consciousness that is not itself structured and organized in the same kinds of terms that the, that the world of the ego in relationship to the object is, is structured. Uh, but when we do think in that ego object way, we, we tend to uh, think in terms of, oh, is it coming from my mind or is it caused by the world, right? We, t we tend to flip back and forth between the terms of a mind-body dualism. Um, and so in that case, if we think about what sexuality is, uh, we will often think of it either as, uh, he, says, he, says, he says, what we're going to find is a zone between automatic reflexes and representation. So we typically think of it as an automatic reflex or representation. We tend to fall back on thinking of it as a, a natural function that's, that's kind of automatically forced upon us. Or on the other hand, as an idea or something that we really choose, and um, and if, if we went back and looked at Schneider's case, like that's sort of what Schneider falls back on. Like he, his, he's his sexual life isn't sexual in the, in the way that a normal, a non-damaged person's experience typically would be. But basically, we would say in the core level, he's not sexual. Uh, there's no erotic dimension to his life, uh, you know, romantic dimension to his life. So he he can go back and forth between two things. There is uh, a very primitive, uh, basic bodily function of uh, erection and ejaculation in his penis and so on. And, and he can think about uh, another person and whether that other person is a good person or not. And so he's got those two things he can have. Like he doesn't, he doesn't seek out any kind of sexual activity. Um, and uh, uh, he's not imaginatively engaged by it. Uh, but his body uh, can still function in those ways, and he can ejaculate. And so, uh, so in that sense, there is something bordering on an automatic reflex that, that happens in him. 
but but in him that experience is uh, is not very interesting to him and has nothing else really attached to it and on the other hand it, he can th if, if you ask him you know, is someone attractive or not um, all he can really do is is say well you know I understand that person to be a nice person or something like that so in other words he's got something that's almost automatic reflexes and representation he shows you what it would be like to if your sexuality were a matter of those things and it would be basically the complete absence of sexuality uh, so sexuality on the contrary Merle Pontis is sort of the living zone between automatic reflexes and representation in which the sexual possibilities of the patient are elaborated um, so we're you know we're looking at the same kinds of things we've been looking at before we're looking at being in the world we're looking at something that is going to be a dimension of bodily responsiveness to environmental motivations that carry out for us our um, inhabitation of a meaningful world uh, but that happens below the level of our explicit reflection so in as much as it happens below our reflection and is something that in a sense we undergo passively something we don't choose we experience it as if it were a necessity so that's how from the point of the ego it can seem like nature causing us and yet on the other hand um, compared to nature the, the ways we act obviously reflect psychological dimensions uh, personal interpersonal familial cultural and all the rest and so in that way compared to strictly natural causal phenomena this looks more like a matter of representation right so you can see why the realities of sexual experience in a sense uh, look look like nature and in a sense look like um, freedom or uh, let's uh, what's the better word uh, mind or self-consciousness something like that uh, and yet uh, their reality fits into neither of those dualistic categories so once again we're going to be at that level of a bodily intelligence or a bodily intentionality as he calls it a way of being directed towards something a way of being um, oriented to engagement with the world uh, that is that is lived out and lived through your body the bod bod bodily connection Merle Ponty uh, uh, links, links the story of sexuality to the theme of affective life. On page 157, he, he says, if, if we're going to reveal the genesis of being for us, we must ultimately consider the sector of our experience that clearly has sense and reality only for us, namely our affective milieu. And then a little bit later, he says, affectivity is usually concerned with the mosaic. Da, 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 da. So right up near the bottom of 156 and the top of 157, he, he right off the bat talking about sexuality he's raised, raised the theme of activity or emotion um, and I want to pick up on that for a second to, to get you to think about this right so in that um, in that habitual world we inhabit non reflectively that inhabitation that that is the presupposed and generally inconspicuous background and platform for our ego life that that world is not a neutral world so we already saw that at some sense in some sense when we talked about lit space and we talked about the, the way that our relation to space is situational not positional which means it's oriented by familiarity and alienation right that you know there's there's a real marking out of the places where i feel at home and the places where i don't and so space is not a neutral set of indifferent positions it's it's got this fundamental organizing relationship uh, that uh, that is that is about you know where I belong where I don't belong where I can go to where I return to where I go from um, and um, and that's and that orientation is lived in a significant way affectively where it's where you feel comfortable and where you don't so we've already seen that affectivity or let's just say affectivity no, affectivity is is the stuff of that 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 part of life uh, but but the affective orientation is a little richer than just 
where I'm at home and where I'm when, when I'm at home, where I'm at home, where I'm alien, alienated. Uh, it's a little different than just uh, comfort or discomfort. There, there, you know, it's it's got um, there are more notes in the scale than that. Uh, uh, and so one of the, so this is the sort of way in which Schneider is really crippled. It doesn't have much of an effective life in that sense. Even talking about some of what, what Schneider is laugh, lacking, he just, Melchon, he brings this kind of theme up at the bottom of 159, and he says, um, for Schneider, faces are neither pleasant nor unpleasant. The sun and the rain are neither joyful nor sad. His mood depends only upon elementary organic functions. I guess that means um, he doesn't like it when he feels like he has to pee, and then he's happy after he's after he's peed, or doesn't like it when he's hungry, or he's happy when, when he has something to eat. Like in other words, um, uh, he gets in a bad mood when, when there's an organic function uh, that needs uh, sort of relief or satisfaction, and he's in a good mood when that comes, right? Um, but anyway, the world is affectively neutral, right? So what stands out about Schneider is the absence, uh, or I should say, what Schneider makes stand out is that by the absence of that in him, he draws attention to the fact that that's not the case with us. So we, our inhabitation of the world is charged with, with a, a rich kind of affective meaning. And that, that is things like, you know, joy or sadness with the rain or the sun or whatever else. Um, and it's, you know, when you go back and think about that lived space of your family home or your friends home, the places where you feel at home, you know, already there you can see that, it, that, the, that there's, um, there are dimensions of meaning to it. Like think about your family house, assuming that's where you feel at home. Um, uh, it's not just monolithic. Uh, you know, probably you you go to the living room when you feel like doing something. So it's got a sense of the place where something interesting or exciting does happen or could happen or should happen. And probably you go there sometimes you're disappointed. But, but you know, that it's the living room is probably something like the place of, you know, activity. And, it, and it's like uh, when you want to get something done or whatever, when you want to get going, like maybe that's where you go. Whereas maybe you turn to the kitchen when you've been working hard and you're frustrated or something or tired and you want to get a snack or something it's not a matter of nutrition though probably use the kitchen for that too but it's not that it's that that's where you go for that um retreat well almost like Schneider, that retreat into organic comfort like you know, i'm just gonna get something to eat just to have a nice taste in my mouth and chew and be able to in a way do something meaningless i can leave that complex world of working i was involved in and go back and just turn myself into an organism that just leaves or something, you know, something like that. I don't know exactly what you do, but but I, I think that thing I'm describing is pretty common. It's very similar, probably, to why people smoke cigarettes too. Um, in the bedroom, like bed, uh, bedroom's got a few meanings, but one big one would probably be it's the place in a way of ultimate rest. Like it's really where you're going to go to sleep. So even if the home in general is where you get a kind of rest from the world, uh, bedroom is where you where you go to really shut down, and so it's a place where you feel ideally the most secure because you can turn everything off uh, and you can you can go there and sleep and let the whole rest of the world fall away and not worry about it and sleep comfortably um, the people have trouble with sleep um, probably have a lot of difficulty with exactly that kind of experience um, people who have suffered nasty things happening to them in the, in the bedroom precisely if the bedroom was supposed to mean that to them can have real troubles around those issues of sleep and security because what was supposed to be the most secure comfortable resting place has been undermined you know something like that anyway so that's maybe some of the sense of the bedroom and the bedroom you know if you think of if you bring sex into that you know the bedroom might also be a place that you that is really you know real more so than the living room charged with excitement because you think that's where i'm going to do that thing that i really want to do with you or whatever um and uh, you know bachelard gaston bachelard has this uh fun very very um engaging imaginatively and intellectually engaging book, The Poetics of Space. And there he talks about sort of like what it's, you know, from people in, around the world live in different kinds of, kinds of houses for sure. But he's just sort of investigating like, what are the different compartments of a house and how are they imaginatively meaningful? And he talks about what the experience of a cellar is like or the attic. And, uh, you know, of course those people have different experiences, but I think for a lot of children uh, in the world I'm familiar with, you know, the cellar is a, in the house is a, is a mysterious and exciting place to explore, kind of scary, attic too. Um, so all I'm getting at is, if you think about the the lived experience of home and you associate that with a house, which it is for a lot of people, 
you can see that even in that sense of home, there's a palette of different colors, you know, or, or a scale of different tones. Like you, you there are the, the, yes, it's the place of familiarity, but there are many different charges and your whole sort of uh, emotional life is articulated, or, or I should say the house is articulated in terms of the whole range of your emotions. And then if you add your girlfriend or your boyfriend's house or your favorite bar or your workplace as, as part of those uh, orienting points of reference on the map of your lived space, um, uh, you can you can easily see that they're going to have a different kind of emotional charge than than your own house, you know. Uh, and so, so what I'm trying to get at is you can you can see already in that sense of lived space the rich dimensions of affectivity of emotion that define the meanings, the lived meanings of the spatial parameters of your world. Uh, now. And, and those, those have a lot to do, do with um, how, how through your engagement with the world as a kind of material reality, you're going to, how you're going to feel and how you're going to be able to do those things you desire, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera, or, or, or be confronted with things you don't desire and so on. Uh, so there's, there's a, in in all of that talk of emotion, there's a lot there's a lot of dimensions of um, attraction and repulsion, to pleasure and pain, and so on. You know that, that that's a lot of what those that those are those are some of the essential dimensions of those emotional experiences. So we'd already talked about lived space as being oriented, and that was basically the core orientation of you know familiar unfamiliar, home alien, that kind of thing. But as as I'm bringing out the emotional articulation of that, we're bringing out the, a richer sense of orientation. You know, this is how you're oriented to the house. The attic, if you're a child, let's say, or maybe even as a grown up, the attic is is uh, exciting and, and secret and a little, a little scary. Um, the bedroom is a great place of, for comfort and retreat. Uh, the living room is where I always turn to when I just want to um, do my thing, you know, or whatever, it's that kind of stuff, right? You can see that they, those those are versions of orientation. Those are more fully pulling out the orientation. So I want to talk a little bit more now about that issue of orientation uh, in 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 our lived inhabitation. And that's what that's the important thing that sexuality is about. It's it's about the way we're oriented towards something in particular, and that is other people. If you're in a job interview or something, and, and especially if you're doing a job interview properly, you know, you're 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 actually going to be trying to assess a person's capabilities, accomplishments, prospects for completing the job. It's a pretty intellectual task. Um, you know, there's going to be an emotional level to it too. Like you're you're probably going to be concerned a little bit about whether you click with this person and, and really whether you think they're going to be a good colleague or whatever. Like that's that all that's all relevant. But but the thing I want to get at is that interviews in that context are really about a kind of intellectual assessment of a of a kind of worldly resource for doing things, you know. And so that's and that's a way you can think about people. Um, and until they uh, make a lot more driverless cars, you know, if you if you get a ride in a taxi or on a bus, a person is going to drive you, and so um, you can interact with someone as a person providing you a service and you have that kind of kind of instrumental roughly instrumental relationship to them you know as Kant says uh, you should the moral imperative is to always treat people as ends and not merely as means you will treat people as means but but you don't have to treat them merely as means and so in those instrumental relations it's not you may ideally you're not just treating them instrumentally you still greet the person and try to be polite but your main relationship to them is how they're going to play a role in carrying out your project. Uh, but I, but now I want to talk about a different way that we relate to people, and that's the sexual way. And the, the thing there is that the, the sexual relationship, the, the sexual attraction or repulsion, I'm going to stick to attraction though, the sexual attraction to someone is a way that uh, you are uh, affected effectively. Right? So the, it's the way you feel something about that person that has to do with being drawn to them 
but it's not a matter of representation. It's not a matter of self, matter of self conscious reflection. It's not a conceptual grasp. It's not like this person would be a good person for carrying out this task or whatever. It's it's a matter of you finding yourself drawn to them, finding yourself struck by that. And that's that's the first significant point that I think I really want to bring out here. Like the key, the core, I guess, of but maybe the key, the key to thinking about sexuality is is to think of it as neither as an automatic reflex nor as a representation, which means to see it as something meaningful. That's why it's not an automatic reflex, but not something deliberately chosen, and and especially therefore not something that's um, able to be simply run by your self-conscious mind. Uh, your reflection. You find yourself drawn to certain other people. He says, this is the paragraph that begins on 149. Here, we can detect a mode of perception that is distinct from objective perception, a genre of signification distinct from intellectual signification, and an intentionality that is not the pure consciousness of something. Uh, erotic perception is not a cogitatio that intends a cogitatum. It's not a it's not an act of thinking that, that aims at, a, at an intelligent, intelligible object. Rather, okay, here's, here's where he really starts to say it. Through one body, it aims, it aims at another body. Okay, so remember, uh, there's that line I quote, uh, quoted repeatedly. This is the top of 81. Uh, the situation provides only a practical signification, and the recognition that it induces is merely a bodily recognition. Well, that's a version of what he's talking about here, right? Erotic perception it, um, through through one body that aims at another body. So aims is the version of intentionality. But so in erotic life, you know, you have a bodily intentionality, your body, and in all the rich meanings it has, not your body as that um, object on the surgeon's table that we talked about and that Sartre talks about, but your body in the in the sense of, your possibility for involvement in situations, your body as the I can that we talked about before. Um, sexual, erotic perception is that body aiming at, orienting itself, taking as its, uh, taking as what it's about another body. And by another body, he means the body of another person. Um, through one body, erotic perception aims at another body. And erotic perception is accomplished in the world, not within consciousness, right? So the thing you're trying to do isn't a thought that you solve by thinking. It's an orientation that is enacted and realized in a, in a worldly practice. So he says, so, so for me, a scene doesn't have a sexual significance when I imagine, even confusedly, its possible relation to my sexual organs or to my states of pleasure. I mean, that's what the, the sort of embarrassingly stupid way that um, TV ads and everything else talk about sex, and probably lots of stuff in the pornographic industries like that too. You know, this idea that um, sex is a, uh, really about a self-consciously chosen instrumental practice of trying to make use of something for the pleasure of general stimulation or something. Of course, of course, a person can do that. Like you can seek things out for that reason. It's just that doesn't have much to do with sex. Um, so, so that's that's just that's representation. Like that's not so different from Schneider. That that's the intellectual design of a plan and the enactment of uh, intentional instrumental relationships to achieve a self-defined, objectively defined goal. Now you can do that the same way that you can get a ride in a taxi or or you can go into the store to try to buy the right shovel to dig a hole in your backyard. Of course you can do that. Um, but, but that has never entered into th that under those terms. That has never entered into the domain of, of sexuality. It's probably true that pe there are lots of people who think that way, and and are actually they're, it's really they don't know what's going on in their sexuality, and so they really are having a certain kind of sexual life, and they just have a pretty flat way of dealing with it because they don't really know how to make sense of it, and they interpret it in those quite uninteresting ways that you get from your TV and the porn industry. Um, and so that's just that's the best they can do to enact their sexual life. So of course those 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 people are still um, 
who uh, engage in their sexuality and probably therefore they're getting a lot more out of the experience than what they take themselves to be getting out of it. Um, if you're interested, you could read an essay I wrote called Why Sexuality Matters, where I try to talk a little bit about that, those kinds of issues in a way. Um, so yeah, you, you could do that. But in that case, that description, the intellectualist sort of description is not really what you're doing. It's a part of what you're doing, but something else is happening too. But you really do, but that description itself is doesn't have much to do with sex. So let's continue, continue what he says. For me, a scene doesn't have a sexual significance when I imagine, even confusedly, it's possible in relation to my sexual organs or to my states of pleasure, but rather when it exists for my body. So it's got it. So people say they're turned on. That's the relevant thing, first of all. It's not about a plan you make. It's you finding yourself turned on first. When it exists for my body, when it exists for this always ready power of tying together the given stimuli into an erotic situation and for adapting a sexual behavior to it. And then and then what is it like to to know or to grasp sexually, right? It's not a cognitive operation, no. There is an erotic comprehension that is not of the order of the understanding, because understanding comprehends by seeing an experience under an idea or under a concept, whereas desire comprehends blindly by linking one body to another. So we're talking about desire, and that's different from intellectual planning. Um, and that's a, the, really the big thing to remember, I guess, about the points I was making before. Desire is when you feel the urge to, in some significant way, couple bodily with that other body. But then as he says, when it comes to sexuality, uh, even though it's long been taken as a model of a bodily function on that kind of mind-body dualism, we're not faced with an automatic reflex, but rather with an intentionality that follows the general movement of existence and weakens along with it. In other words, uh, in your your sexual life is gonna is, is gonna be is gonna reflect who you are in general. Like it's 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 part of that. It's a it's one side of that basic thing we've been talking about about how you become a who inhabiting a particular world. It's it's the it's the you know it's it's a side of that core function of engagement with the world that is the the root root process behind that whole history of your experience that uh, has produced that you as an ego subject and so on. That's the stuff we've been talking about for the last few weeks. So then he talks about Schneider and the things he's missing because because he's saying there. You know, sexuality isn't a separate thing. Like it's not something attached to your, your what do you call it, reproductive organs or something like that. Uh, uh, that's when he's talking about this automatic reflex stuff. He's, he's saying, you know, what happened is Schneider was crippled as a person and all of the things that go into making a person got crippled. And so his sexuality is crippled in the same way that his spatiality is because they're part of that same function. And so he, that same function, the, 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 the I, I mostly, when we talk about spatiality, I really only talk about the beginning section when he talks about lived space and positional space, but he explores much more deeply in that chapter, Schneider's problems, in order to bring out an, oh, an awful lot about, about space, but about vision and touch and all kinds of other things. Uh, and that chapter kind of concludes when he gets on page uh, 137 to the notion of the intentional arc. Uh, I'm not going to go through in detail, but I'll just draw your attention to that. So basically what he says there is, there is a, a way in which a person kind of has a, a, a single thing they're doing that is that is kind of reflected in all the facets of their existence, but it's not a, a pre-given thing. It's uh, it's more that through the ongoing enactment of your experience, um, the, all the different things that are happening kind of uh, make you a, a single experiencing perspective, and that singleness also shapes how those things uh, are carried out. That like there's kind of a mutual communication or mutual reinforcement between something like the unity of your experience and the multiplicity of your experience. And by multiplicity, I don't mean this experience, this experience, this experience. I mean something like um, you have motor skills, you have or you have motor powers, you have sensory powers, you have sex, sexual orientation, you have uh, intellectual powers, like these quite different, weird set of uh, things human beings have. Um, you have, you know, four or five major sectors of life. Uh, perceptual, motor, intellectual, emotional, uh, and they 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 work together, um, but they can, in fact, they they can come to fall apart in certain ways. But one of the things he says here is like, there's never something really that just strikes one. What gets struck is the unity of you as a person, and so you might it might primarily show itself in in, in intellect 
into your intellectual powers, but it's also going to be reflected sexually, perceptually, in, in, in movement, uh, or et cetera, et cetera. Um, anyway, so he calls that, that the, the way that those differentiated sectors of our powers kind of retail, well, I'm going to say one more thing about that in a second. The way they, that they basically function as a unity, he calls that unity the intentional arc. Um, let me skip back and say the thing I was going to say to clarify that your body has hands and shoulders and head, right? And um, they, they kind of work together, but they remain differentiated. But because as he was saying before, you, you know, the different parts of your body effectively envelop each other, uh, what's going on in your shoulder matters to your hand, you know? Uh, if your hand is damaged, other things will take over that hand function. So something that damages your hand doesn't just affect your hand, it's also going to affect how you live your your um, arm in relationship to your chest for holding things or your shoulder for poking buttons because you don't have fingers anymore or, uh, or whatever, right? Um, the very meaning of each of the parts of your body is a, is a, is a meaning, is, a, is, is that they are how you do something. And so the you still has to be able to do its stuff if you're missing those parts. And so other things will, in a way, take take over some of those functions. That's, that was that phenomenon of substitution we were talking about. But, but so you can have something that damages your hand in, you know, in the sense in which it didn't damage your shoulder. Like it's your hand that got blown off by the grenade, not your shoulder. Uh, so, But at the same time, in damaging your hand, all these other things get affected too. You can have something that damages your hearing, but it's going to affect all of these things. And Marvel Ponti is saying that, so the way I'm talking about body parts there with respect to the unity of the body, he's saying that same thing with, re part, with respect to these really this fundamentally different sectors of our powers, like the, the ability to, to move, our motor abilities, our ability to sense, our ability to think, our, our uh, affective life. Um, I should read you one more sentence about that. Uh, 137 at the bottom. Uh, this intentional art creates the unity of the senses creates the unity of the senses with intelligence and creates the unity of sensitivity and motricity. And that's what goes limp in Schneider's problem. Um, and these things in a way control apart and so on. Um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that notion about the intentional arc because I was talking about Schneider and, uh, and that remark where he says, uh, it's not an automatic reflex, but rather an intentionality that follows the general moon of existence and that weakens along with it. That was at the bottom of 159. He's referring back to that same intentional arc he was talking about with Schneider. And the point there was that your sexuality um, is is your sexuality. Like it's about it's about you and and about uh, it, in a significant way who you are as a person are 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 in that thing. So you're in that way the sexual dimension of your life is. It's picking up on this kind of automatic reflex thing, like it's it's not just a place that does something that is officially defined as the sexual function, right? If you were, if you were studying um, the animal world, you might very well talk about the sexual function, and people will talk about that in relationship to human beings too. But that's not what sexuality is. That's not our sexual being. Our sexual being is how whatever that dimension of the sexual function or whatever else is becomes that through which we have a kind of meaningful grasp of the world, right? The, 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 the way that that other body is going to appear to me and grip me uh, isn't going to be just a story about physiology again, right? It's going to be about the meanings that are infused in that other body and in my body and in a sense of what that coupling is that that the means that have become infused into that through that whole history of, of establishing and inhabiting a world, right? It's going to be, um, you're going to use your hand as the person who you are engages graspingly with the world, and you're going to enact those sexual relationships in the way the kind of person you are has uh, come through that range of capacities to inhabit the world. Uh, so what I had been talking about was the idea that sexuality is neither a reflex nor a representation, but it's a it's that bod bodily intentionality, um, it, that notion of a, a bodily recognition of a practical significance that he talked about in Phantom Limb uh, and the idea here of the erotic perception that through one body aims at another, uh, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, 
So now let's talk a little bit more about that experientially. Uh, so here he introduces quite a nice notion. This is back on 158. So he says, there must be an eros or libido that animates an original world. Um, I guess I think the sense of that original world, I, I think the point he's making there is that the sexual significance of things is not reducible to anything else, right? That it, it That is a meaning in its own right. Uh, even though, I, I, and I guess even though, now let me give you the even though. Uh, the even though, I think, is what I was trying to get at before when I was talking about the intentional art. Even though sexuality is not autonomous in the sense that it is a thing you do wholly separate from everything else. Sexuality is not, on the one hand, it's not um, just, as Merleau Ponty says in here, there, an autonomous zone, by which he means um, it, there isn't such a thing as just a sexual meaning, and then there are all those other meanings, and it just has its own single thing that it does. Uh, uh, so it's, it's, it is integrated in its meaning with our perceptual life, our intellectual life, our every, everything else, right? Our, our motion, our motor life, our spatial life. Um, it's integrated with those things, and that's and the intentional arc is the idea that um, there is a single identity realized through all those things, analogously to the way that there is a single uh, animal life. A single animal experience realized through all the limbs and joints and organs of a body. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, sexuality nonetheless is not reducible to anything else, and that's what he means when he says it animates an original world. At a certain level, you can't say what space is; you just got to experience it. At a certain level, you can't say what time is; you just got to experience it. Similarly, at a certain level, you can't say what sexuality is, you just have to experience it. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're talking around that when we talk about the way uh, through one body it aims at another body and aims towards a certain kind of bodily coupling. Um, uh, let's carry on with what, what he was saying back on 158. There must be an eros or libido. Uh, eros is just a Greek word. For this, uh, from which we get the word erotic. So this erotic, uh, animating erotic force, an eros or a libido. Um, I don't know the origin of that word. It roughly means life energy, uh, but Freud uses it. And so he's he's ca conjuring up here Plato and Freud, an eros or a libido. Uh, Freud uses it to mean sexual energy, right? So there, there must be an eros or a libido that animates an original world gives external stimuli a sexual value or signification, and sketches out for each subject the use to which he will put his objective body. Uh, actually, just as an aside, yeah, he's conjuring up Plato and Freud in a certain way. His his chapter is going to validate, vindicate, vindicate the interpretations of sexuality that you find in Freud and in Plato, and, and sort of show them to be of a piece, um, not just simply taking them over all together, but to say, like, yeah, what those guys are doing, like, yeah, that's... That's what phenomenological investigation of sexuality reveals. Uh, but anyway, uh, there must be an aristotle libido that animates an original world, gives external uh, stimuli a sexual value or signification. Right. In other words, there, but there's got to be this 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 uh, impulse that um, uh, makes it be possible for things to appear to you in that relevant sexual way and and sketches out for each subject the use to which he will put his objective body. So he's saying this thing that um, makes salient a certain ways of perceiving things outside you and makes salient certain things about your own body. And then and then he's going to elaborate that in the next couple of sentences. And, and I think these sentences are quite uh, quite rich and, and could be used. You could, you could build a lot out of them. I don't know how much people do build out of them. I know a few people have written about it. But I think you could build a lot of this. Anyway, he says, for Schneider, it's the very structure of erotic perception or experience that is altered, largely lost. Um, but for the normal person, a body, another person's body, is not perceived merely as just another object. Rather, though we have that objective perception, you know it's that, this objective perception is inhabited by a more secret one. Um, and I think that notion of secret is a little bit important um, capturing something about what what the meaning of sexuality is. Now, I mean, I think sexuality is going to have a lot to do with something like intimacy. And so secret makes sense in the 
in the sense that it's about something not exactly shareable uh, and uh, well shareable maybe with another person but like not public not shareable universally and maybe that's related to his point back on 156 that he's going to talk about uh, experience of a world that has sense in reality only for us um, but anyway, so I think that word, word secret is relevant and it, it's going to come up a little bit later when we're on page 1781 or 172 or something with another rich section here. I think he's trying to capture something about a tone that sexuality has. And anyway, I think that word secret is, is phenomenologically relevant. But, but anyway, um, this objective perception is inhabited by a more secret one, colon. The visible body is underpinned by a strictly individual sexual schema that accentuates erogenous zones, sketches out a sexual physiognomy, and calls forth the gestures of the masculine body. I mean, he's been talking about um, Schneider and, and so on. There doesn't have to be masculine body in this case, it is a more generic statement, uh, which is itself integrated into the effect of totality. Uh, I mean, I think he's, he, in other words, I think he's talking about um, the sexual perspective a man would have, a masculine person would have, um, but that's not, integral to the overall account he's trying to give of sexuality as to the way he's talking at this spot. But anyway, the relevant point I want to get to is this notion of a sexual schema, uh, an individual sexual schema that accentuates erogenous zones and sketches out a sexual physiognomy. I want to talk about what that means. To do that, I want to first jump back to, again, the, the chapter on space and the opening section. We first talked about the notion of a body, a bodily schema. So I didn't talk about that when we talked about space, but but I talked about the idea and I'll just go over it quickly. Uh, we initially talked about the, the notion of situational space by talking about how it is that you your body knows where the rest of the body is, right? Your hand knows where your shoulders and so on. Um, that That's the body schema. The body schema is the way you live from a sense of uh, your body as um, a power for engagement. So he distinguishes it from, from a more familiar notion that we sometimes use of a body image. So we sometimes talk about people having a body image. And by that, we usually mean something like a, a kind of reflective representation, right? Like the, uh, an explicit idea they have of themselves and especially of something like what, what the visible contours of my body look like. Um, so, that, so, so he wants to take that and differentiate the body schema from that. We're, 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 we don't mean that. We, we mean how you how you experience your own body, what your body seems like to you, but not at the level of a reflective re, um, reflective representation of your body as an object, but at the no, uh, a non-reflective grasp of your body as a subject, as the living power for engagement. You, you always operate on the basis of a lived sense, essentially of the unity of your body. Um, and of the, your, the unity of your body as a power, and it's and so there's a there's a maybe I can say this to clarify there's a kind of a self consciousness built into your body, um, uh, which is evident in the fact that your your hand knows where your shoulder is when a mosquito is stinging it. It's also evident, you know, when you can hold an egg without crunching it, like you know how much a pressure to put on, but you don't particularly think about it. You know, you you have it's like it's like you have a living sense in your hand of this power and how to gauge it and control it. Um, there's, there's a kind of an I in your body that is the unified functioning of all those things. Um, uh, but that bodily, well, it's the I can, right? That bodily I um, is, not, is not reflective, it's not a representation, and it's not about the body as an object, right? It's the lived unity of yourself as an acting subject, spatially distributed as this manifold body, right, with differentiated things like the grasping part and the chewing part and the walking part, that while differentiated are nonetheless uh, different sort of nodes or facets of a single acting function. Like that, anyway, that's that's. Uh, I tried to pull in a few of the themes I've just been talking about, like with the attentional arc and so on, but that's that's the that's the body schema, right? Well, so the thing is, Jerry talks about a sexual schema. Now, initially, he's talking about a sexual schema as pertaining to the body of the other person, but it pertains to you as well. So he, he says, what happens is your perception of the other's body is is the perception of that body as sexually relevant. So the 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 body is 
um, perceived for you in terms of your non-reflective motivation towards a kind of bodily coupling with with bodies of others that attract to attract you and in light of that the the way that body appears is perceptually different things are perceptually highlighted right it has its own sexual schema which is and, and it says it, it, it sort of sketches out a sexual physiognomy may accentuate erogenous zones but it's not like oh you always look at a person's shoulders or chest or eyes or it's, it's not it's not a matter of you kind of a set of independently defined body parts that you identify which again is the misleading mistake of pornography and whatever else rather um the as he says a strictly individual sexual schema another body expresses itself as a sexually attractive being through all the differentiations of, and determinations of its body, but it's but but exactly how those lines and contours and pieces and shapes are going to be thus expressive is uh, that's the style of the person. Like that comes from the individual. It's not it's, you can't just say what's well, got this part and this part. And in a way, what is expressed when he says it, it sketches out a sexual physiognomy? Well, to the extent that the erotic perception. Uh, in erotic perception, one body aims at another body and comprehends in the world through a kind of coupling. Uh, it, it is, in a way, how that body expresses or communicates possibility for uh, engaging with it as a body, right? Um, and he says, you know, that accentuates the erogenous zones. Like, no doubt, it is the case that, by and large, though surely not exclusively, no, no, this is the case that, by and large, the things that we think of as the sexual characteristics of the body um, play a prominent role in that. But it's not a matter of, a, of an inventory of six parts. It's, the matter, it's a matter of the unique uh, sexual expressiveness of another body. And what it does is it calls for, it says it calls for the gestures of the masculine body. I mean, because he's imagining a man in that situation and a masculine man. But rather, it's, it's what calls forth from you, the appropriate bodily response. It just calls to you, calls forth from you as a body, an appropriate response. Um, uh, so anyway, I think that that description is quite interesting, and I wanted to connect it with the theme of the body schema because even though he's talking about the other person's body, it seems to me, and in the other case, he's talking about your own body. That other person's body, in its schema is speaking to your body as something from which a response is, is elicited. Um, and so there is, in other words, a pairing of your perception of the other's body and your sense of your own body as a kind of sexual agency. Um, there, you know, probably a lot of people really get inhibited in their sexual life by the imposition of their body image in place of a body schema, right? So. The, the, the more straightforward thing would be, and, and probably a lot of people have this sort of natural, sort of more naive reaction, and it's, and it's presumably what comes out in truly sexual or erotic situations. You, you live out of your body as a sexual thing, but, but without really particularly construing it as an object. But a lot of people probably get hung up with their own explicit representations and can't, can't let themselves be a body a bodily subject, but have to manipulate their own behaviors, right, and, and uh, uh, get wrapped up with things about what they think they look like, um, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, so, you know, you can see how that notion of a body image or the notion of cognitive reflection actually uh, is probably deeply antithetical to, to sexuality as such, which is about coming to inhabit a body, a body, the parameters of which are revealed to you in the dynamic of attraction and interaction. But what happens is that what should be happening that way can be interrupted by trying to, to make it answer to the demands of reflection. So if you want to read more about this, I, I, I think one of the best places to read is uh, Being a Nothingness, uh, Sartre's discussion of, of sexual desire. The thing that Sartre identifies as the decisive and definitive thing of sexuality is what he calls the caress. 
and, and he's trying to say, what is the meaning of sexuality? He says, you know, the real meaning of sexuality it is this um, uh, erotic comprehension that's not of the order of understanding, where desire comprehends blindly by linking one body to another. Vasarsha, I think, better than Merleau Ponty, goes into that and talks about what's happening there. And he's, he talks about sexuality as, in a way, becoming bodily. And he says that caress is the dis definitive sexual act. And he says the thing about the caress is it's it's essentially how you let the other person be flesh is what he says. I'm not going to go on and explore it. You could go read it. It's quite great. But but the reason I think it's it's particularly important is because the reason I'm bringing it up is because Sartre it seems to me does an excellent job, an excellent phenomenological job of describing what the distinctive character of sexual experience is what the distinctive character of a sexual act is, as opposed to all the other kinds of things you do. Uh, really trying to distinguish it from automatic reflex and representation, but but not just doing it negatively, trying to say, okay, what is it? And so I was saying before, like, like so many things in experience, if you don't actually have a living engagement with it, you don't really know what's being talked about. Like you can't, you can say lots of things to define it, but, but you in a way have to know what it is from being inside it. Um, and that makes it hard about anything, time, space, whatever else, ever to explain it perfectly. It's, it's really a matter of taking experiences that people have and working to illuminate those things. Um, but Sartre, I think, does a particularly good job of illuminating what it is that makes an experience sexual. So I would recommend that as a strong, this, the study, the discussion of the caress as a, as a strong piece, complementary piece or supplementary piece to put into these pages here to capture capture that. But anyway, yeah, so let's bring it back to the body scheme of, because because the point I was trying to get at is that uh, here's here's why we bring it back to that and then here's why we'll add something to it. We're trying to bring it back to this idea that something about the unique appearing of the other person conjures up in you a certain sort of appropriate, uh, appropriate response. And so you're living out of a kind of sexual body schema in the sense that you experience yourself as a kind of sexual agent. Uh, where your body is charged with the relevant meanings for engagement in a sexual situation. That's, that's how I'm linking it back. So he doesn't use the word sexual scheme to talk about yourself as far as I know. He just says, uh, calls forth the gestures of the masculine body. But the interesting thing is he does use that language to talk about the other person. And, and I wonder if that also allows us to add something. Uh, and, and later on in the book, he, he talks about a kind of sharedness of body schema, that, that uh, we live in sort of cooperative relationships such that we, uh, at a lived level, our sense of our own body can incorporate in a way the others and so on. I, I want to note that idea that there's a sense of the other person's body that is integrated with the sense of your own body. And this is not particularly reflective, though you can reflect on it. But it's, it's interesting then to think of that sense of the body schema, the sense of the I can, the sense of your inhabitation of, of a body as in some way intrinsically connecting with the experience of someone else's body. We're now talking about that experience of you being non-reflectively attracted to another being. And, and as an aside, you know, that's a reason why, you know, gender is not a matter of choice, right? Gender, both in the sense of yourself and in your sense of your uh, chosen sexual object. Um, we're, we're talking about lived experience. We're talking about the way you as a reflective evil find yourself compelled by the world. And so, you going back to that thing about the sexual schema, like there's there's a way that you find other bodies attractive, and it's not something you it's optional. You can't choose and say oh, I'm gonna have that. Like you find yourself attracted by bodies that communicate their sexuality to you in a certain way, and you find yourself uh, drawn to respond to them. So you you know, Mirabel Ponti, as I said, was talking about a man and time with the gestures of a masculine body, but the the, the analysis is actually giving really. Would, be, would would say like you may very well live out of a body schema in a sexual context that feels this way to you or this way like you uh, maybe that the way you interpret that is like I experience as a woman or or I experience as a man or I experience as something else entirely right the, uh, but the, the relevant point is these are things that are not matters of reflective choice right these are matters of how you find yourself already coupled with the world in, in these effectively gripping ways that pull out of you 
behaviors and behaviors about kind of bodily cup and this one. <coughs> so anyway, that's, that's some of the resources there for a phenomenology of, of gender, basically. Yeah, I think that's enough for talking about um, this section from 158 to 160, but I think it's a really good section for trying to bring out what, what you need to do to talk about sexuality. And the point is we are those kinds of beings and it is integral to our experience to be sexual and, and therefore just as your hand is integrated into your body, your sexual life is integrated into the rest of your life in the context of that intentional arc. And so um, uh, uh, it's at least the case that in our sexual life, we will find reflected the things that are going on in, in the other parts of our lives. So in that sense, the kinds of investigations you get in Freud, psychoanalytic reflections are, are exactly what you would expect to be right. Looking to sexuality as the domain of the sort of unconscious things that are at, at play in your psychological life and so on. I mentioned that before, and when we talked about live time and live space, I was saying why this makes something like psychoanalysis what you would expect to be right. Um, well, now that we've added the sexual meaning to all of our experience, that's a further way of saying, well, yeah, you actually the thing you're doing in psychoanalysis is, is, is something you would expect. And not surprisingly, then Sartre goes on immediately to start talking about um, Freud and psychoanalysis. Um, that's the next section. Uh, but as, as we've talked about it now, sexuality would, would just be one more sector among many. Yes, your, your life is going to be reflected in sexuality. But, but that doesn't mean sexuality would be privileged as a thing that you should turn to to try to understand things. Um, so now we want to talk a little bit more about what goes on in sexuality to see why actually uh, it does have a certain kind of privilege with, without losing its distinctive character of sexuality. And indeed, uh, because of something about its distinctive character of sexuality, that it has a particularly pivotal place in our psyche. And this is where we get into the issue of other people. says on page 170, uh, to say that I have a body, it's talking about this in, in the context of sexuality, what, what, is, what, what is this sexual meaning here? He says, to say that I have a body is thus a way of saying that I can be seen as an object and that I seek to be seen as a subject. And then a little bit later down, he says, um, in the context of sexual life, we do not attempt then to possess a body, but rather a body animated by a consciousness. Um, so do those, those two passages on 170 both speak about a certain thing, right? So he's saying in, the thing is, in, in sexuality, you, you are encountering someone who is a subject, and it, it is a person that you're going to couple with. And you also are a person, and that other is going to couple with you. As, as, uh, in coupling with you, they're going to be coupling with a person. And so the, the, the thing he talks about here um, on 169 to 171 is basically that idea that our reality as free subjects is, is alive in sexuality. In that sexual encounter, a free being is coupling with another free being. A free bodily subject is coupling with a free bodily subject. So whether you like it or not, sexuality is the domain of freedom encountering freedom. And, you know, to cut a long story short, and if you want to make that short story long again, go back and listen to the lectures on Hegel, uh, the independence and dependence of self-consciousness. The encounter of freedom with freedom uh, has norms built into it and issues built into it. Um, and so in, in sexuality, what happens is this, this um, bodily comprehension of another body as attractive that calls forth from me certain processes of bodily coupling, calls from us bodily coupling, um, is in fact an encounter of a freedom with the freedom. And therefore, there's always going to be a question uh, of how well this practice is living up to and realizing the reality of what's happening there. And so the domain of sexuality, um, it, you know, people talk about it in, in the sort of bad ways I was criticizing before. People talk about it as if it were the domain of uh, instrumentally pursuing uh, genital pleasures or something like that, that's quite far from the issues that are actually alive in, in sexuality. Sexuality is actually a domain where 
what comes into play are all those complex issues of, of uh, recognition that, that Hegel talked about. And Merleau Ponty makes that very explicit. He says, the, these things would never happen if sexual, this is at the bottom of 175 lines up. These things would never happen if sexual experience were not like a passive experience given to everyone and always available of the human condition in its most general moments of autonomy and dependence. So the point is, what comes to be alive in your sexual life is that issue of how you are involved in a cooperative activity with another person and sharing a human space in your bodily coupling uh, in whatever form that's taking. So uh, why, is, why then is sexuality such a privileged spot for understanding ourselves and for understanding the meaning of the world? Well, because in sexuality, though, though it, uh, it has this d distinct character of being this uh, bodily coupling with a body and so on, uh, in sexuality, what is actually being encountered is one freedom by another. And so at its core, sexuality is one of the one of the most basic domains we have for encountering other people. And so consequently, in our habitual embedded identity and our, our, our being in a sexual world, being in the world with the word sexual added, right? In, in that in that habitual world that we has now become the basis of our life that is a sexual world, the core meanings are the the meanings of our defining orientation towards other people and so on, right? The, the, uh, and so that's why, um, and, and this is the thing that Freud you know, ends up exploring so powerfully, you know, how in our sexual life, in our desires and our hangups and, and all those kinds of things, what you actually end up seeing are the interpersonal struggles a child went through with his or her mom and dad, and then the playing out of that in the difficulties that grown up child now has in dealing with the larger human world, right? So in our sexual life, you know, we were talking about sexual life as sort of bringing in the, the terms of how the world is meaningful for us that we live on, right? Think back to the talk of the habitual body in the phantom limb context. Well, the, the, that habit body with respect to sexuality is, is where we um, built into our world our basic relationship to the human condition in its most general moments of autonomy and dependence. And that's why sexuality and hence psycho, why sexuality is so important and hence why psychoanalysis is in fact so particularly important and insightful in, in the approach to understanding of humans. So the last thing I want to say then is uh, about this before we move on to the section on language is the transition to that. So what we see in sexuality, then, is that at a, at a core level, it is the domain in which persons communicate with other persons. So sexuality is a kind of communication between persons and a communication enacted in bodily means. It's the way people communicate to each other in these intimate interpersonal ways who they take each other to be, and they do that through this kind of bodily coupling. And in that sense, then, sexuality is a, a kind of original and core phenomenon of language. And so let's go on now and talk about the language chapter. <laughs>